Hey, historians, um, as we continue to reflect on Reconstruction and learn about Reconstruction, today we're going to focus on a couple of primary sources. I'm outside the STEM building. It is pretty hot. Let's hope the computer doesn't overheat again. Um, and it's also prom day, so there's cars hitting each other and all sorts of craziness. Um, but I want to look at specifically some primary sources because that's often the best way to really understand what was going on at a time. We're going to look a little bit today um, at the words of Ulysses S. Grant. Now, I mentioned to you guys um, in class that he spent all his final days in Saratoga, New York, writing his memoirs so that his family would have money to live off of after his death um, while he was dying here of uh, throat cancer. And in his memoirs, he writes about what we spoke about earlier, about what happened when Lincoln was assassinated. And remember, he's still a general. This is just a few days after the surrender of Appomattox. He departs Washington. And he wrote, it would be impossible for me to describe the feeling that overcame me at the news of these assassinations, more especially the assassination of the president. I knew his goodness of heart, his generosity, his yielding disposition, his desire to have everybody happy, and above all, his desire to see all the people of the United States enter again upon the full privileges of citizenship with equality among all. I knew also the feeling that Mr. Johnson had expressed in speeches in conversation against the Southern people, and I feared that his course towards them would be such as to repel and make them unwilling citizens. And if they became such, they would remain so for a long while. I felt that reconstruction had been set back. No telling how far. And he goes on to talk about how he then gets on the train to go back to Washington, D.C., and more about his concern over Johnson being the next president. Mr. Johnson's course towards the South did engender bitterness of feeling. His denunciation of treason and his ever ready remark, treason is a crime and must be made odious, was repeated to all those men of the South who came to him to get some assurances of safety. Uh, so remember, you know, Grant didn't take this word from Lee. He knew that there was a careful line of how to approach uh, healing and reconstruction, and so did Lincoln. And when he later became president, he had to sort of undo a lot of that damage that Johnson had done. So what is some of that damage that Johnson did? Uh, one of the things was he vetoed the Civil Rights Bill, right? A civil rights bill that Grant later tries to pass, uh, a bill that really didn't come into fruition over a hundred years later, really after, about a hundred years later, I should say, after Kennedy is assassinated. Now, if you read the whole bill, he has some points and not all of them are off base, um, but he sees some harm. So not only is his harm in how he treats the Southerners, but in what he does towards limiting the rights for freed blacks. And he wrote that four millions of them had just emerged from slavery into freedom. Can it be reasonably supposed that they possess the requisite qualifications to entitle them to all the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States? Have the people of the several states expressed such a conviction? It may also be asked whether it is necessary that they should be declared citizens in order that they may be secured in the enjoyment of the civil rights proposed to be conferred by the bill. So to enjoy rights, do you need to be a citizen? Think of what Tanny wrote um, in the Dred Scott decision and what sort of ideas do you echo here? Also think about the idea of states' rights, right? He um, thought if a lot of these freedmen were to be granted rights, that it should be done on the state level, not a federal level. So you still see a lot of the causes of the Civil War, you know, they have not gone away just when the war has ended. So years later, when Grant becomes president, um, he realizes one thing that has to be done is that the states have to enforce these rights that are in the Bill of Rights. It's not, they're not just federal rights, they're for everyone. And we learned that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are called Reconstruction Amendments. And the 14th Amendment is the one that secures these rights um, by the states, due process, equal protection. So he wrote, I do nevertheless deem it my duty to make known that I will not hesitate to exhaust the powers thus vested in the executive whenever and whenever it shall be become necessary to do so for the purpose of securing to all citizens of the United States the peaceful enjoyment of the rights guaranteed to them by the Constitution and laws. So you see the former general coming out here. 
um, as president, he will use his executive powers. If you state are not going to enforce this amendment, I'm going to make sure you do. Right. And that's important. Now, one of the documents you'll be looking at is Frederick Douglass's reply to the colored delegation. And what happened is in, I believe it was February of 1866, 13 um, black leaders met with the president Johnson and there's a typo there. Um, and their goal is to persuade him to change his approach in reconciliation and freedom, um, under what, you know, was happening with reconstruction. They wanted to make sure that all black people could vote. Well, at least black men, but Frederick Douglass did support suffrage as well for women, um, to create a new political party that would bring together both freedmen and poor whites. A lot of them who res were resenting in the South, the freed blacks, um, they did not persuade the president. And you can actually read the exchange that was written between it. Um, Johnson told Douglas that they were trying, if, if he did this, there would be a race war in the United States. He reaffirmed his ideas that it was up for states to do that, not the federal government. Um, and what you'll be reading is the open letter for publication that Douglas wrote in his response. So it's good to know this background before you do it. It's also important to note that as he left the White House, Douglas said, if the president, oh, if the president will allow me, I would like to say one or two words in reply. You en enfranchise your enemies and disenfranchise your friends. He sort of knew that Johnson was, his plan was not a good one. And I want you also be reading um, the words of Thaddeus Stevens. Um, he has a few speeches on Reconstruction. You can find his one in 1865. You'll be reading his ones from 1867. Now, Thaddeus Stevens was born in Vermont, but um, lived in Pennsylvania and was a congressman from there. I believe he was a Whig, but at this point he was one of the radical Republicans, the ones who they thought it was so extreme because they wanted to make sure all these freed men had rights um, right away, not gradually. So he did campaign for full voting rights. He did support the Reconstruction Bill. Um, and you'll be reading what he, um, his response to being called a radical. And just one line from it. I am for Negro suffrage in every rebel state. If it be just, it should not be denied. If it be necessary, it should be adopted. If it be punishment to traitors, they deserve it. Keep in mind, um, some of his radical ideas, he believed that plantations, the land should be taken and given to freed slaves so that they would have land to live and work off of. Um, he also was born during George Washington's administration and died on the eve of Grant becoming president. So just think of sort of how he fits into history. He was not the only person who sort of um, had a, these radical views, um, but he's one whose words we're going to be looking at. So keep this background in mind as you read these documents. Um, and look at their cause, um, look at their goals, look at the obstacles they faced, and look at those obstacles in light of today. How far have they come and what still has to be accomplished? Oh. See you guys later.